G'day, I'm Steve Hay, this is Wonderful World of Woodworking for Carbotech. And this is a pre-recorded stream, but I'm live in the corner, and so I'll be attending the chat. Just had some issues trying to get the cameras to work in this particular workshop. Don't know what they were, but anyway, I thought this was the best option. What I want to do is make a dragon's egg, resin dragon's egg from scratch, to show you all the steps and what's involved. This is one that I did the base for, the last stream that we did and it came up very very nicely so i'll show you how to put it together how to make the inside how to mix the resin and then what i have found to be the most effective way of turning resin because believe me i've had some disasters along the way but it's all a learning curve and i'm happy to pass my knowledge on to you so first of all what you need is a cup or a container of some sort that you want to actually put your egg in or the base for your egg before you can start. I'm just using a medium sized glass that you get from the picnic part of the supermarket and that I find ends up to be quite a nice size and you're not using too much resin either. The next thing is get a piece of timber or in this case I've got a really nice piece of buckeye burl that yes, I have shaped it and I've sanded, I actually sandblasted this, but if you've got a compressor or a wire brush, you can get the same results. All you want to do is get any of the loose bark or dirt or grit that's on there off, because what'll happen if it's loose, when you put it in the resin and the resin's curing, it'll actually float away and then you'll get blemishes and bits of debris in your cast. So first of all, get it doesn't have to be burl either. I've done some with really pretty bits of timber. It just happens I had a bit of burl around, so that's what I'm using. But clean it first, and then you've got to shape it so it fits nicely into the container you're going to use. Just like that. Uh, and these obviously beakers being tapered, you're going to have to sand a taper on it. If you're using a straight cylinder, um, you don't have to worry about the taper. And then what I do is I'll glue it on, I'll glue it on the bottom. But we'll get to that shortly. First of all, in order to get a nice colour on your inside of your dragon's egg, it's best, I find, to paint the piece of timber with a matte black, just an ordinary acrylic. That's just one I picked up from, I think it was a, a big box warehouse and they're about $2, $2.50 a tube, nothing flash whatsoever. And if you noticed, I've also lost the top to that, but we'll paint this um, so it's black and then I'll dry it with a heat gun and then we can put a coat of resin color on the top before we do the casting. So here goes, get a little container. Paintbrush, bit of water, and squeeze some of the paint into the container. You don't really need very much. That's more than enough. I'll find that top one of these days. I give it a couple of squirts of water, just so it thins it out a bit, and then just paint it all black. If you don't, what happens, the colour doesn't have the intensity that it does on the black. It sort of mutes it a little bit, but it doesn't matter. Try it either which way. See which way works for you. Uh, this is going to be the whole process. I will do a shortened version which we'll put up as a standalone video. But I thought it'd be really nice if we can to do a stream in real time. So two things. One, you get to appreciate actually 
what goes into making one of these and actually how long it takes. I do fast forward a bit uh, because I've got one in the pressure pot that I cast earlier but I'll show you what to do with that and then we'll go over to the lathe and actually turn when you can see all these little pockets in here. It's not detrimental if you miss them but it's good if you can get them all. There we go. Now I don't paint the base and the reason I don't do that is because I'm going to glue that to the bottom of the container that I'm using and if I put paint on it I've had this happen before when it goes in the pressure pot and look pressure pots aren't mandatory you can make these without a pressure pot but if you've got the use of one I do recommend it because it does make sure you don't get any bubbles. Although I've done these without putting them in the pressure pot and they work just fine. Just remember to cover them up when you leave them so you don't get any... Have I got some around here? Yeah, I'll show you, I'll show you why it's important to cover them up. Because if not, you get mosquitoes landing in them or flies and they tend to ruin your job. We're nearly finished. Um, these paint brushes too, nothing special about those. I think they cost me about four cents each or something or other. I buy them in bulk, 60 at a time because uh, with the acrylic it's okay. You can get more uses out of it but Sometimes with the resin, if you use it, you only get one usage. And if you're paying, you know, six dollars a paintbrush, that's money you could spend on something else, as far as I'm concerned. All right, there we go. As you can see, it's now all black except for the base. And you can leave that dry and it'll take a little while. Or you can do what I'm going to do and just put a heat gun over it. You can get um, these little containers, you can get tops for them too. It's, you just put that over, it keeps the paint dry for a little while so you can use it again if you've got some left. So all I'm going to do with this, you could leave it out in the sun you could leave it and go and have a coffee. I'm just going to put a... I'm just going to put the heat gun on it. It doesn't take very much. Careful not to burn your fingers. That's another reason I don't add too much water because then it doesn't take as long to dry. We're nearly there. If you're using a burl or something like that, um, yeah, you do run the risk of splitting the timber, but quite frankly, it doesn't matter. And just for those who don't know, on the tips of my fingers, yes, it's getting very warm. We're nearly there. Okay, so that's what you've got. A burl that's all nice and black. Next off, go to your colours and see what you like. I quite like that. That with a bit of a bit of greeny blue, I think those those two colours. Those two colours I like. So those two colours are what I'm going to paint the burl with. 
Now I've, I've got, this is just um, wax paper. I will put a bit of water in there just so I can save this brush. Give it a bit of a clean there. That'll be good. And what you can use, you can use resin to paint this, but what I've found is if you use a UV glue. It's very, very handy. And the thing I like about it, it doesn't go off until you actually put a light on it, a UV light. So I've got a, a couple, these are torches and I've got a, another one that I use in another setup. But all you do, you don't need very much of it either. Just squirt a little bit in there. As you can see, I haven't used much. And then get your colors. I like paddle pop sticks too, I buy those bolt and just put a little bit in there and stir it up like that. Now it remains pretty fluidy until you put a UV light on it. I've got a new paintbrush and I'm just going to paint this. You can put several coats of paint on if you like, which I will. I'll dry this one. And then I'll put a bit of that green on. And I don't know, I'm, I'm just looking, I might put a bit of purple on there as well. But it really makes the blue stand out like a midnight blue. Pretty special. Uh, I should be wearing gloves, but I forgot. But when I start working with the resin, I definitely will have gloves on. I wear glasses as well, but it'd be an idea if you had safety glasses on because this can be a bit nasty if it splashes in your eye. See if you can get down where these little, if you're using a bell, where the little bubbles are, see if you can actually put some of the color into that. Because if not, when you put your resin in, there's air pockets in there and you do get bubbles rising to the surface. Which again, if you've got a pressure pot, it's not really an issue. But if you're not using a pressure pot, and I've had it where they've risen to the top while the resin is curing, and they um, get trapped in the egg, which, you know, sometimes that's a feature, and it doesn't matter, but sometimes you don't particularly want bubbles in there. How's that looking? That's looking pretty all right. I think we'll just about get that done, which is good. Oh, a little bit on the top here I haven't done yet. Okay. What I'm going to do with this one, I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of copper over it, I think. Or bronze. Just a little bit. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, the other reason I've got that cloth down is because I've done it before without it and it just stains my bench. So a little bit of paper there is good. Okay, as you can tell, you only use the slightest amount. And to clean your brush, just use some acetone and it cleans your brush out. I'm going to put a different colour on there, so I'm not too fussed about that at the moment. A word of caution, when you put your UV light on, make sure you haven't got any glue around, whether it be your, your brush or the glue itself, because it will send it off. Now all I'm doing here, this is setting the glue, and it, it doesn't take very long at all. Don't get it on your hands and do it because it's extremely hot. And not very pleasant. It's marvellous stuff. The back of, I've got an MX-5 and the back of the soft top, the window after a while they get brittle and they break. This stuff's great. You just put it on there, put the light on there and fixes it. Doesn't make it any clearer but it stops the rain from getting in. Okay, so that, I think, that is just about done, all right? That's now dry to touch. What I'm going to do now is just a little bit more and I'm going to put a little bit of green on there, I think, just a little bit. Not very much at all. There we go. It's got a little bit of copper on it from the time before as well. And uh, the stuff I'm using is called eye candy. Mix it up. And get your brush. Doesn't matter that it's got blue on it because it's all gonna go together anyway. A little bit of that. And I'm just gonna put maybe just a couple of Dobs on it, nothing artistic or anything, just putting a couple of splodges to give it a little bit of break up. Okay, and that's it. That I will now throw away, but before I do, I'll clean the brush out. <laughs> A little bit of, as I said before, acetone. If you do get resin on your fingers or, or whatever and you're not wearing gloves, that's the stuff to get it off. But if you've got any cuts, it'll let you know in a hurry you got cuts, I tell you. Burns a bit. Okay, so that's cleaned the brush up reasonably well. This I'll just go and put in the bin. Will I need to put that in the bin? Yes, I will. All right, now we'll just set that green, green paint off. These, these are really great fun. Once you start, you sort of get addicted to doing them. They're just so much fun. Yeah, pick your timber too. This is Buckeye Burl. This piece here is Yellow Box, an Australian um, desert or semi-arid timber. Very, very hard. And yeah, you've got to have sharp tools or you get into all sorts of trouble. But this Buckeye Burl is lovely. It's softer than the resin, so you don't have any issues with it at all. You can have fun too, there's, um, oh, what are they called, fluorescent, fluorescent um, tints you can get to put in the resin, so when you're looking at something it doesn't look all that spectacular and then all of a sudden you put the light on it 
and it, yeah, it looks really, really great. Okay, so I think that's a little bit tacky on the back still. So I might just leave that there while I'm just looking for something else. No, I don't think it's there. I thought I had something else to show you, but no. This, this one here, this is just, oh, <laughs> that's the fluorescent green. But when you put the light to it, it's just, it's going to be extraordinary when that one gets turned. It's actually under that green there, there's purple, and then there's coffee beans, and this is just uh, leftovers from pours that I've done. So I put them in a big container. There's another one of, there's a couple here that I'm doing. These are going to be um, canisters. I've just got to cut those. That's walnut shell and pearl essence. And what I'm going to do is cut the tops off those. Hopefully I'd love to put a screw thread in there and turn them into canisters and that that one's <laughs> a cicada shell that i found and i think it just looks pretty amazing space bug that's what i'm calling that one space bug okie dokie well that should be cooked by now yep so get your cup what I do is you just put, oh, you can either put it on the bottom, put it on the bottom of your bit you're going to be working on. Put the top on. Get the cup, put it over the top and put it down so it clearly is on the bottom. You can see the glue there. And just touch the UV for a little while. And that glue will cure. And there you go. It's stuck. It's not going to come out. Oh. So now we've got to mix up the resin to put in there. I'll just move, I'll, I'll just move this stuff away because I don't need it at the moment. And I have found, I'm not the tightest, for those that know me, I'm not the tidiest person around the workshop by any means, but I have found it is most advantageous to be at least a bit organised when you're doing these pours. Now previously, on the, another stream, I said I was mixing by volume, and that worked quite well. And then I discovered, on the Carpetech website actually, with resins, that there's a formula that you can do so you can actually do it by weight. And for me, I must admit, I think it's easier than by volume because I can be far more accurate with what I need. Let's just get my calculator here. The formula is times whatever weight you have initially by 0.43. And that will give you the amount of hardener that you need. So, <clears throat> let's see, we're doing that one there so we can grab one of those cups. It's important you use a clean cup when you're pouring resin. If not, you can contaminate it. Let me just get rid of that stick. Speaking of contaminating. So I've got the cup, I've got a pair of digital scales that you can zero and the resin I'm using is perfect cast, rigid casting. I said before I've had issues turning it and it's true I had. 
I think I prefer turning deep cast, which is this product whoops, down here. That's for deep casting. Although it's not designed for river tables, I think it turns nicer. But anyway, I have had more success with turning this after a few um, goes. And when we get over to the lathe, I'll let you into a couple of the tricks that I've learned when I'm turning it that makes it much easier to turn and much nicer to turn than what was happening before. Okay, first things, we'll do the um, resin. Plonk that on the scales. Zero it. And I know I'm going to need or about that much resin. So I'm going to guesstimate two thirds. And we'll see what weight it is. Okay, it's 137, 136 grams. So to find out how much hardener I need, I'll go 136 times 0.43. That gives me 58.48. So 58.48. So I tear weight that, bring it back to zero. And then with the hardener, I just pour in until I get 58 grams in there, 58 or 59 grams. Pour it in slowly. Two things, one, you don't get bubbles. And secondly, you can be more accurate. Okay, well, I'm just a couple of grams over on that. But it's close enough. I'll put this out of the way. Now to stir it, I've made up these little stirrers that fit into my drill. And I'll do a video shortly of how I made them. And they work just fine. They really, really do. This is the stage I'm actually gonna go and put gloves on. Whoops. Just got these disposable gloves from the hardware shop. Um, when you get them, make sure you get a size that fits. I've got big hands, so I, I've got XL. And uh, I was finding the L's kept on breaking, which wasn't very nice at all. All right. Now, don't have it flat out like that, obviously. Hold, hold the cup. And I'm going to do this for oh, about two minutes. It says four minutes. It says four minutes on the directions. But I think if that's by hand, I've been doing this for two minutes for quite a while. And have not had a drama. And I've just got to scratch my nose. It's not part of the tutorial. It's just part of life. So I'm going anti-clockwise, the beat is going clockwise. I can change it so the beater goes anti-clockwise, then I'll turn it clockwise. I don't know if it's because I'm left-handed or whatever, but I prefer going the other way. And with this, I can get right down to the, the bottom and start mixing anything that's down there. Don't have it too fast, because if you have it too fast, you can create bubbles. Which again, if you've got a pressure pot, it doesn't seem to be as big an issue than if you don't. Just be careful not to spray yourself. 
I'm going to have to make a bench that's smaller so I can sit down and do this. That's about two minutes, but I did stop to scratch my nose. So I'll go an extra 15 seconds just to make sure. But I'm sure it will be fine. It's had a really good mix. The thing I've noticed when I've made these stirrers, you have to make them long enough that you don't get resin that goes up the shaft. Because previously I've done that and the resin <laughs> Stuck to the drill chuck and I couldn't get it out. Okay, that'll do it. Yeah, just. There you go. Let's put that out of the way so it's not in the row. And bubbles will come to the surface of this which if you're going to um, use the pressure pot isn't a, a big deal the pressure pot doesn't get rid of bubbles what it actually does is compresses the bubbles so you don't see them and that's why you should leave it in there for at least four or five hours I did one the other day and I thought oh I should be right after a couple of hours and I took it out and it looked great and within about 30 seconds all these bubbles started to appear and then when I put it back in it had gone past that point in curing where they could be compressed. So you see, being impatient gives you lots of lessons to learn. All right, so I'll take you over to, we'll use this one. Okay, so I'll take you over to the pressure pot. Okay, and this is a pressure pot I use. And it's a 50 psi. This was pressurized last night. It's a standard cheap um, paint pressure pot. You do have to do some modifications to it before you can use it. One of the things that I've done is I have an extra connector there that's blanked off. So when I disconnect the main feed, it uh, seals it. And also having a good locking mechanism at the back is good you can get these this is a um the one i had originally it's a small one and i found this a little ball cock and i found it leaked whereas going to this larger arrangement it wasn't that much dearer it's fine so take the pressure out And once the pressure's gone, undo the lid. Remove the top. And there I have two that were done the other day. So, what to do with these? Well, I'll show you that in a minute. Now we're just going to pour this in. This has got some bubbles. It's starting to heat up a bit. So, so I'm just going to wave a heat gun over it. And the bubbles just disappear. Gone. See that? And gently pour this over what we're doing and the slower you pour it the less chance you're going to have of getting bubbles and that's it throw that away 
If you were going to do another pour, you could keep that container and do another pour, but we're not, so it's okay. So if you look at that now, I think it's going to make a beautiful egg. Got a couple of little bubbles on the top, which really don't matter, but if you can get them off, it's much nicer. Yeah, it's looking pretty clear. You can see a bubble coming up there. So we'll just hit that with the heat gun. And this is where, as I said before, if you don't fill up those little nodes or nodules in the burl itself, you're going to get air escaping from there a lot. Which, if you're using a pressure pot, isn't a problem. If you're going to do it by air, then it's best to get them out if you can. You can just see them popping up. And they're just coming up because of pockets in, um, in the burl. And I just built it on my hand. That's why you wear gloves. All right, let's go and put this into the pressure pot. What I've done to mine is I've got a flat um, ice cream container on the bottom of a bucket, which I've slipped in there, which then allows me to pull it out and clean it if I have to. And it's also got a flat bottom, whereas if you look in there, it's got a rounded bottom. And sometimes it's hard to have things to sit flat with a rounded bottom. And gently put it in. Make sure when you put your top on that your rubber seal is sealed all the way around and it hasn't come away from the edge. If it does, that's when it'll lose pressure. Pop it on there. Tighten up the clamps. I do them opposite each other. And in turn, so I don't just flatten one down hard, I'll do these two a little bit, then these two, and then back to these two. So they, they're even. Airline. I'll have the stopcock off. Put the airline on. Then open up the drain cock. Not hard, slowly, because all that air is going to rush in and it can knock your job over if you let it go in too hard. I'll bring that up to between 40 and 50 PSI. See what it wants to do. That's going to be close enough, that's 48. For the purpose of filming, that will do. So now, I shut it off, remove the air, put my blower back on, and that blanked off one, I just put over there as a protection. Now, I'll leave that for, oh, I don't know, Maybe till six o'clock tonight or maybe till tomorrow, it doesn't matter. Um, I'll just clear up the rest of this. You can clean this up with um, acetone, acetone as well. Or I've found even if I just leave it on there, it doesn't really prove detrimental. It still stirs quite well. So 
And now we've done that, we're all finished. I'll take these gloves off. Your hand feel as if the resin's on there because it's all horrible and slimy and yuck. But when you take the gloves off, they have been totally protected. Just put those in the bin. The next thing to do is cut this one out of the mould. They come away pretty easily. And that's what we have in that one. That's going to look quite pretty. Next step is to glue a block on the back. For that, you're going to have to flatten this area off here, which I'll just go and do now. I did that on this sander, but you could use a drum sander, you could use a file, whatever you like. The only reason we want that is so when we put a block on there, it's nice and flat and it'll hold firm when we put it in the lathe. I use just two part epoxy. Whoops. Mix it up fairly well. And then don't be too scungy with it. I like putting it on both surfaces to give me a, a really good even coat. What I try and do with these blocks is get one that will fit in between the jaws of the chuck on my lathe. So that's it, then we put that on there. And we'll clamp it. Here's one I clamped the other day. So that's what we end up with. It's always a good idea if you're gonna put anything with epoxy in a um, vise, just put a bit of paper down, doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be grease paper, any sort of paper, that way if the glue drips out it won't go in your thread of your jaws. See if you can get it as central as you can, sometimes isn't easy, that's not too bad. So don't clamp it too hard, so you squeeze all the glue out, but clamp it so it's firm. And then this is what you end up with. And this now will go over to the lathe and we'll turn the dragon's egg. Okay, I just had a cup of coffee between then. But what I've discovered is when you're turning resin, there is no point in trying to set it up to go with the dust extractor or any sort of um, extraction system. The reason being when this comes off and you'll see it, it comes off in long ribbons. It will get jammed on the impeller of the dust collector and also if you've still got those safety guards in front of um, your port, it jams that up and it clogs it and therefore is not very good. Um, if you've got a straight vacuum cleaner, that works for a while, but again it clogs up around the bag and it's not effective. So what I've discovered is when I'm turning resin, I just turn it and let it all fall on the floor. When I'm sanding it, then I would like to have a dust extractor or at least a mask. Now to start with, I'm going to wear just an ordinary protective mask. 
The reason being that I can talk to you while I'm turning and you'll be able to hear me because my microphone's there. When I actually start doing the sanding, I'm going to be using a filtered mask, but you might hear the hum of the fan inside here. So to start with, I'll just use a face shield. And then when I start doing the sanding, I'll use a pro proper respirator sort of setup. Okay. Uh, what else do we need? Yeah, as I said before, I try and get this size to fit in between these areas of my jaws, like that. Then we just lock it up. Another reason it's, it's important to make sure that glue is really set so when we start turning, it doesn't come off. In the early stages, I will move the live center up to it. And you'll notice as we start working, this will burrow into it, which is fine. Ah, oh, okay. To start with, I'm just gonna use a roughing gouge. And for that, I'll grab a rubber sorby roughing gouge. Most of the turning, I will use a skew, but I'll use it as a scraper more so than a skew. And that will become apparent down the track. There, that's about all I need, I think, for starters. We might use a pairing tool later on. But for now, rough and gouge, scraper, uh, scraper, skew, used as a scraper. And as always, when you start off, make sure it's free. Um, I'm going to start off at 600 RPM and just see what that's like. It should be pretty good, actually. Yeah, it's got a little bit of a wobble. I'll bring it up. Okay, I'm at 800 now and the lathe's starting to vibrate a bit. So, that's what I'll use. I just want to even this up a bit. As I said before, the live centre will go deeper and deeper. Turn that off and check my tension, I think. I thought that was... Better. There we go. And I'll start up this end. That's why you wear a face shield. I'll start to increase my preferred um, speed is about 1400 RPM. Seems to give me the cleanest shavings. And not much chip out. All I'm doing at the moment is trying to get rid of that cup shape. And I can see there I've already gone through the resin into the timber. there but that's fine because that really that's what you want you want that contrast
Now that's becoming more balanced. I'll whack it up to 1400. I'm starting to get a cylinder. It's okay to leave leave this centre bit a bit fatter, but see if you can just bring it down to round. This one I'd prepared to do a stream a couple of weeks ago, and it has got a little bit harder than what I prefer. I, I think if you can turn it within two or three days of it first curing, it's much nicer to turn. But the longer you leave it, the harder the resin gets. But due to technical difficulties, we couldn't do those streams. So there you go. Um, from my experience, turning resin is totally different than turning timber. So a lot of the techniques that you use turning timber, I have found, I'm not saying it's not true, but I've found they don't work very well on resin. So you have to develop another skill set, if you like, for turning this stuff. When you're just turning resin, it's lovely. That's all you get. But then when you start mixing your mediums and you've got resin and timber, that's when it gets interesting. That um, Buckeye Burl that, well, this is here and what we just cast is really nice. But when you start playing around with some hardwoods like... Um, that yellow box I've got, totally different ball game. Okay. I might just come in there. Take that back a little bit. Very careful not to hit the jaws of your chuck. Okay, now I think I'll just use the skew. I might get another scraper out later. But at the moment, this will work fine. You start to get that harmonics up, that noise, tighten your tailstock a bit, or change your speed. I'll bring it down. When I'm scraping, use it as a negative scrape. So go in, but have the handle up so you're not biting into the work. If you try and do it like a normal skew, no, it's not nice. So just short, sharp little turn. But keeping it negative. Slicing action into the base. And that's going to form 
the bottom of your egg. I find once you've got the base, the rest of it is pretty easy. I've got a flat spot here I want to get rid of. So by getting rid of that, I'll have to go a bit smaller in the base. And there's another one there. Ah, that's all right. Remember, keep negative rake. I'm actually below center. If you're going into the base, use the toe of the skew. Because if you go in this way, you can't get right deep down into that union. And your tools have to be sharp. If not, it's not as much fun. Okay, now I'm just going to, because I've had a bit of harmonics there, I'm just going to tighten up the chuck a little bit to make sure it's tight. Off we go again. Oh, hang on. We've got those flat spots, and there's a little bit more to go there. But that's it. It hasn't got far to go. If you're just starting out in turning, learn how to use both hands. It'll save you so much grief. So now I've got that in my left hand, in my left hand like that. And then when I turn around, I can have it in my right hand with just the same amount of control. We'll do in a minute, I'll put a cut off in there. You don't have to stick with the egg shape either, you can have whatever shape you like, but seeing I said we'd do an egg, I'll do, do this one as an egg. So this live sander, it's gone into about there, so we've got to make sure we don't get a hole in the top of the egg. So you can draw that in. And if I can now come in under there, where that line is, I'll tuck it back. In other words, this can be the base, and then I've got to bring this in. And as I do that, I'll then adjust the center of the egg and maybe the base of the egg. We will see. Let's see what happens. I might do see the parting tool to bring that down. Oh wow. 
clockwise. Okay, so I know. <laughs> How often have you done that? Got a mask on and you try and blow something with it. Okay, so I think that's covered the point. So what we can do now is bring the egg around. I'll change, change hands so you can see a bit better. See even that, that's quite a nice vase shape I guess. But we're not doing a vase, we're going to do an egg. And by bringing that around, we've changed the dynamics. So now I've got to bring this shoulder down, which will also change the shape of the egg. You can use ordinary scrapers if you like, but I find using the skew I can get to use a lot of different methods with the one tool. And the good thing about calling these dragon's eggs, no one can tell you you're wrong because no one's ever seen one. So you can say, well, that's how they look. Do that so I can see what I'm doing. One, two, just making sure that's all working. And that's recording, that's good. You can see how as I point this, I have to change the body, so it's in proportion. I might just move the stand a little bit closer. Oops.
can do with the tool. The less sanding you have to do. I'm reasonably happy with that as a rough shape. What I'm going to do now is come down. That's got to be a bit thinner there, but I'll come down and start shaping this. tear out there. We might, I don't know. for me. Turn that up whilst I'm doing this.
Okay, now yeah, back to shaping the egg. At this stage, what you could do would be, no, I'm going to take a bit more off that I think. You can do a lot of the sanding while you still get your live sander in. Greatly reduces the risk of it breaking off in the stand, and we might do that in a tick. Yep, okay. Okay. Now comes a bit where I wear the other. Now comes. The bit when I wear the other mask, because I don't want to be breathing this dust. There we go. And I'll start with 100 grit and work my way up to 400, and then I'll start going wet and dry. I bring it back to about 600. I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's what I like. Okay, that's to 100 grit, and make sure you've got equal scratches all the way over. And then when you have, go up to the next grit. I'm going to 150, I think. Yep, 150. Seems to me my mask needs to be charged. And seeing I'm on a roll, I'll use this, and I hope I can still talk underneath this. It's not ideal, I would much prefer the mask, but this, this will do.
This is 150. And the lathe's at 800, <coughs> which isn't too bad. You really want to clean out where the egg meets the stand. I might have gone a little bit too deep on the timber, but uh, we will see, we will see. Okay, this is 180. Yeah, I might just knock that back a bit. And that 220. And when I stop this, you'll see it's not as bad at 220 as it was at 100. Because all you're doing initially your first sanding, doesn't matter what you're doing, your first sanding is always to get it smooth. All the other sandings after that are to get rid of the sanding marks from the sandpaper before. Watch your knuckles on the on the jaws of the chuck, because they can wake you up. Okay, now I think I've got 240. We'll stop that and have a look. Yeah, that's not looking too bad. Now this is 240. See, we can see more definition there, and those scratches are going less. Now 320. You don't have to have these same increments that I've got here. Um, but the smaller the increments, the less time you have to spend on each paper. And 400. At this stage, I go back to the skew, 
take the end off and finish shaping the egg. So that means I'm doing this up. So what I might do there, I might, um, I might actually polish that before I do this. All I'm going to use there is a little bit of beeswax. And we might go in here too. Just friction polish that. And you're using the cloth, have it in your hand like that. So if it does pull away, just pull straight out of your hand. And don't have any loose threads hanging around. Much safer. Yeah, that's looking all right. Okay, now we'll take this part off here. And to do that, I'm just going to part it off using the skew. You could use a parting tool, but sometimes that can shatter and not give you the finish you want. Now that's now finished. I'll take that off. Put it over there. I'm going to clean this off. Again, negative rake. Using it as a scraper. corner there, I just want to take that out. Don't like those harmonics because they generally leave a chatter mark. Let's see how that looks. That's pretty good and the hole's gone from the end. So now, basically just on that end, quickly go through the papers again just to smooth it all out don't have to go all the way down here but just on that little top section
Can you see the idea behind shaping everything and polishing as much as you can while you've got that live centre in? Because then you're not putting much pressure on the job once it's done. I'm just lightly touching this. Got little scratches there to get out. That's 220. Yeah, it's not looking too bad. Now where did I put my 240? There it is. And I'm only just holding it on there. There's very, very little pressure at all. I'm just making sure that it's smooth and I haven't got any ridges coming along there. This is 320. Now we're up to 400, which is what we finished it with. So we can just blend it all in a little bit. And there you go. Now I'll move on to wet, wet and dry. And I'll start with 400. And then I'll go 600, 800. I'll go up to 1,000. And then I'll go to micro pads, which I'll show you in a tick. I'll find a bit of 400, 600. 400 gone. There we go. A bit of 400. Try not to get the timber at this stage because you don't want to get it wet and that's another reason I put a wax coat on there. So if it does get wet, it's, um, turn it down, it uh, is protected. You can't help getting the timber that's actually in the egg wet. It's just one of those things. Let me turn that down. The okay, that's 605, 600 is nice. Again, not much pressure. Just working this slurry that I'm building up here. That's good to get into the mix. And even after your first um, run with 400, you'll really be impressed and amazed at what it's starting to look like. There you go. Now we'll go 600. And you don't have to spend very long on these lighter grits. because the scratches you're getting off are only small. That's 600, now I'm going to 800. And you can tell the number because it's written on the, the back of the paper. And this uh, wet and dry, it will last forever and a day. Very tough stuff. Okay, that's 800. And I want a thousand, which is this one. And a thousand, it's going to be looking pretty nice, I think. There you go. That's at a thousand. And now we'll go 1200. Which is that one.
Now we're really starting to get a nice sheen on it. You can see the glitter and everything happening in there. This is when I go over to micro pads. I can find them. Now they come micro mesh, mesh. They come with a little color guide and the pads themselves match the guide. They're on, let me put that up there first. They're actually on a foamy uh, backing and it's the same grip both sides. So what I do is I set them up in order that the colors are, so I don't know if we'll go quite that far, but we've got 12,000. Eight. Eight thousand, which I can't find at the moment. Is that eight thousand there? No, we'll go six thousand. And we got four thousand, three thousand six hundred, three thousand two hundred, two and a half thousand, fifteen hundred, and oh that must be eight thousand there. Okay, so then you can, if you like, just no, that's, that, 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 that. Eight. Set them up in the colours that are arranged on this sheet and then just put them at the end of your lathe. Go from one, okay, we've done 1500 now, uh, 1200 now, we we'll go 1500. And I turn the lathe right down for this. Not much pressure. I turn it up a tad. Okay, that's about four seventy. That's fifteen hundred. Eighteen hundred. When you get up into the over 2,000, really, there's not that much difference. This is 2,500. Um, I do have wet and dry paper up to 2,500, which I use for French polishing, which these would be way too small for French polishing. But it just depends what sort of a, a finish you want, I guess. And we're up to 3,200 now. 3,600. I'll turn it off and you can have a look at this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
All right, that's 3,600. We'll go straight to 6,000. The higher up you get, the less time you spend with each grip. This is 8,000. And this is 12,000 which I don't think I've ever used before in my life, but there you go. Okay, let's have a look at that. That looks pretty spectacular, I reckon. So what I'm going to do now is put a little bit of polish on it. I haven't tried this before, so we'll give, give it a go. I'm going to put a little bit of this that I've used before. This is good stuff, glow. This is mainly for the timber side. So I want to get that into the timber. And then I've got some acrylic polish. So we'll see how that goes. A bit of glow on there. We'll see how it looks on the plastic actually before we go any further too. Okay, try not, you, this is a friction polish. So you do have to put pressure, but be careful how much pressure because you haven't got anything supporting your egg. See, that looks pretty... Pretty special, I think. I'll try a little bit of this acrylic polish and we'll see what it does. Well, I reckon that's pretty darn nice. Just got to get down here and clean this bit up in there, I think. Find a nice soft bit of cloth. Now we just got to part it off. 
This is the part where everything can come unstuck. No, it'll be good. It'll be good. A parting tool always make sure you go one and a half times the width of the blade that way it won't catch. Don't think I meant to do that. Dragon's egg, all finished. Mask off when you blow, don't you? There you go. All finished. Well, I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, that's actually going to a friend of mine that wanted a blue one. Oh, what can I tell you? Well, it's been a long stream, and uh, I'm pleased we got it done. I'm sorry it wasn't live, but as I said, Broadcasting being what broadcasting is. Sometimes you get gremlins in the work, but I guess the main thing was I was in the chat room. Looking forward to uh, seeing you again very, very soon. I think next time I'm actually going to make a native beehive and it'll be in the other workshop and it will be live because all the cameras will work. So until then, if you like this channel, please hit the subscribe button for Carbotech. And if you need anything woodworking ish, Give Carpetech a ring or check them out online, carpetech.com.au. And this is Steve saying thank you much for your patience, your patronage, and your interest. And I look forward to having your company in my workshop again very, very soon. Till then, look after yourselves, be creative, and enjoy whatever it is you're doing. Bye for now. <laughs>